Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey, folks. Would you consider the early church anarchists? Would you even go as far as to consider Jesus an anarchist? This topic is a debate that we see among Christians quite a bit, and in today's episode, we hope to help answer these questions and many more about the topic as Alex Christianopoulos, author of the book titled Christian Anarchism, joins me and special guest host Nicholas Harrelson. Right. Would you rather serve God than serve right. Caesar, you know me? Right. I'm just trying to live what he said. I'm just trying to live. Nicholas, how are you doing? I'm doing well, sir. How are y'all? I'm doing pretty good. I, uh, I We were talking before we started recording that Abby was kind enough to let you take her spot. And I don't know if you had to get her some kind of special gift or send her something special for allowing you to sit in her seat today, but that'll be between y'all two. Yeah, you know, I uh, I, I think I, I fanboyed just enough for her to have sympathy. And uh, I think she just requested that I make fun of uh your home state a couple of times in the uh I, I, in the podcast. I don't recall that one bit <laughs> i don't think that happened at all I, th- <laughs> I think you do that on your own quite well anyway yeah yeah I'll, I'll go easy on you i promise i've heard that before so let's uh introduce alex today he uh he wrote this fantastic book on christian anarchism and that's a something that we talk about quite a bit on this show. Alex, how are you doing? I'm uh, not too bad, as is the most enthusiastic they'll say in England. I'm fine, thanks. <laughs> so since this is your first time on the show, and if there's some folks that might not be familiar with you, why don't you give us a little background to yourself and just tell us whatever you want us to know about you, and then we'll get started. Sure. Um, I think I have to start with a bit of a confession, which I'm a bit more open about in, in recent interviews, which is I don't really have a religious background, you see. When um, when I went to school, it wasn't a religious school. My parents weren't particularly religious, although my dad uh, wanted me baptized as a Greek Orthodox because he watched a documentary a few days before I was born about how that's tied with Greekness, and he wanted me to be Greek, at least in part. Um, but I got interested in things religious, Broadly speaking, towards the end of my BA, um, once I was in England, I mean, you know, French and Greek, grew up in Brussels, I'd been in England since I uh, started uni. And that this is around 2001. I got more and more interested in religion, but wanting to understand, not knowing that much myself. I mean, of course, I was aware of some of the main things out there, of Christianity and some of the teachings of Jesus and so on. Uh, and all the while, this has also appeared in my life when I'm finishing my um, MA in international relations and European studies. I'm thinking of doing a PhD. I'm not too sure what I want to do it in. And it's also a period when George W. Bush is in power and 9-11 hasn't happened yet. And uh, this is someone who has said, had said in his inter- in, in, in one of the caucuses that um, his favorite political thinker was Jesus Christ. And all of that was kind of piquing my interest. And then my MA finishes on 9-11. Like this is, we're sitting through an exam that begins 10 minutes after the planes crash into the towers. Um, And then three hours later, all of us having written about the international order, reflect on how much has changed or not. Um, And so all of that kind of fell together, if you want. And I, I became interested in investigating the relationship between religious and political structures. And this is then a period when I'm also kind of looking at uh, what Jesus said. I'm, I'm, I'm reading the gospel, if I'm honest, for the first time, like start to finish, wondering exactly what's in there and so on. And I start thinking that, you know, what Jesus says is quite political, even if subtly so and perhaps indirect, yeah, yeah, doesn't advocate particular ways of governing things in the way you might have on political advice. But to the extent that it's political, it's quite subversive because very sort of emphatically sort of I don't know, strong on nonviolence. And this has repercussions for the state. And around then, and I can't remember exactly when that comes in, Tolstoy falls on my lap. So, I, you know, obviously, because of these interests, I kind of, you know, I quickly get hooked. I really like what he says. I like his way of writing. But I also quickly feel that 
there are gaps. So to cut a long story short, once I start the PhD on religious and political institutions, I'm, I'm made to sort of rethink some of it because what I had in mind didn't work too well. And I quickly decide that I want to do a PhD on Tolstoy's political thought because I realize there's very little that's been done about it out there, at least in the English speaking world. There was at least then no book that really tried to summarize or book length study that tried to kind of capture the main elements of his political and religious thought. And I was interested in it also because if you want to try and do what he does, which is to, I suppose, take as literally as, as, as you could, perhaps, what, what Jesus says and apply it to politics and to the state, then you have to consider Romans 13 and you have to think about render unto Caesar and, and, and I suppose, Paul's letters more generally. And Tolstoy does not do that. He dismisses Paul for all sorts of reasons. I thought, for a start, he's not Jesus. Uh, I mean, he's got his various ways of dismissing him. Um, and he doesn't tackle render unto Caesar much. And and around then, I come across Werner Deller, Jacques Ellul, um, Dave Andrews, Michael Elliott, Catholic Worker Movement, who I didn't know all that much about by then. Um, Sotoresi Day, Peter Morin, Eamon Hennessy, I come across Yoda's writings, etc. And I, I start thinking, okay, if you bring those voices together, I think you can make a pretty good argument that a fairly consistent application of Jesus's teaching and example into politics amounts to a form of pacifist anarchism or something along those lines. And so the PhD becomes theorizing Christian anarchism, a political commentary on the gospel. The book is basically the PhD with a f slightly fewer typos, still too many, <laughs> um, and without the word theorizing in the title, because the, 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 the publisher said that's got to go. But otherwise, it's actually the same project. So, I mean, I take it off um, in the introduction and other parts as well. But maybe that helps explain why it's framed the way it is. And something that maybe isn't as obvious as it could have been on reflection, there's things I would do differently, is, is how the book is very much kind of... Uh, by and large, an exegesis, like it's trying to understand, you know, if you take the, the stuff we know from the gospel that Jesus said and has done, what does that amount to when it comes to politics? So what I tried to do with the PhD and therefore the book is to, as I say in it, to kind of weave together the, the disparate voices that argued that Jesus' politics and example kind of pushes us towards anarchism and to weave them together to put as coherent and consistent an exegesis as I could, according to which Christianity ought, I suppose, to amount, or following Jesus ought to amount to a form of anarchism. I like that. And so what, what's interesting is what you just said. You kind of started when George W. Bush was in power. And anybody that's been following this podcast for any amount of time has, has heard my story a number of times about that was the first time I voted was for George W. Bush. I was a one-issue voter. The Republicans were talking about or speaking against abortion, and the Democrats weren't, okay? And then you mentioned 9-11, and then 9-11 happened. That very next day, I turned into a card-carrying neocon. I didn't know I was a neocon. I just thought we needed to go get them back, you know? I took the word seriously that Bush said, you know, if we don't kill them over there, they're going to kill us over here. You know, I bought into all of that. That lasted, I, I lasted that all the way until, you know, when Trump was, nominated and I couldn't get on board with him. This, I'm just trying to give you a, a background of, of where I came from because it, when, when Trump was nominated, I was done with the Republican Party because as a Christian, I was understanding or I was seeing the, seeing the words that he was saying, the word, the, the language he was using, and I was seeing so many Christians latch onto it regardless of the things he was saying. Forget what I was believing as far as going and turning the or making the sand glow as ted cruz would say you know but what trump was saying was more disturbing to me for some reason and the, it was really disturbing to me is how the christian how christians were just falling in line with him you know so i i, I broke away from it started understanding anarchy and it started kind of lining with my faith so that's just kind of my background as far as that and you mentioned pacifism in, in your uh background there or or what you were learning when you were getting ready to write this book and that was something else that I've, I've come to understand as well as pacifism through this, with this project. And when you take the, te the teachings of Christ seriously, you understand that he was a pacifist. You understand that the early church was pacifist. And then you understand what pacifism means 
and, it's, and, and, and how we are supposed to respond to the state as pacifists. I don't know how else a Christian could respond to it if you were taking the words of Jesus seriously or if you're just nitpicking certain, you know, verses in the Bible. You know, and people do that all the time. Christians do that all the time. They pick what they want to out of the Bible and ignore something else in the Bible. You know what I'm saying? So I want to start there with this conversation is the pacifism aspect of this, because I think it's very important to understand pacifism and Christian anarchism and how they go hand in hand. Yeah. And that's my impression, too. I mean, you know, I have lost count of the number of times I've heard people tell me that you can make the Bible say anything, you can find any position in it. And much as I think it's true that in any religious tradition, for that matter, you can I suppose, find the excuse or the arguments to sort of frame things in a particular way as opposed to not, you know, to a variety of ways. I, I, I don't think the argument is that strong in that the New Testament, certainly the Gospels, what we hear about Jesus, who Christians are supposed to follow, and uh, yeah, it's pretty clear and consistent on love and forgiveness instead of violence. It's relentlessly systematic on that. Do not resist violently, but turn the other cheek. Don't judge one another. Love your enemies. I mean, this is the stuff that demarcates Christians from other religious traditions morally. That's what a lot of people say. It's the turning of the other cheek that's particularly um, I don't know, specific, I don't want to say extreme, but it, it's notable uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the moral teaching of Christianity. You know, when people talk about how uh, a lot of religious traditions ultimately preach a similar set of moral guidelines, etc., even if that's true, and I don't, I'm not saying it is, I think it's more complicated. Uh, the point is there are also distinct, distinctions and distinctivenesses, if that's the word, and, and and this turning of the other cheek is, is what particularly distinctive about Christianity. Forgive 77 times. I mean, the example that the whole arrest, trial, and crucifixion gives, the example of the cross, uh, I think, is particularly telling um, from an anarchist perspective, I suppose, as an example of, as I say in the book, obviously, of, of um, both the violence that will befall the consistent Christian, nonviolent, pacifist, anarchist, if you want, and um, the response that's expected to it, uh, and, and, and a response of love and forgiveness even unto death. And so for many Christian anarchists, especially Tolstoy, but, but others, and I acknowledge, by the way, we could go into that if you want, that Tolstoy is an awkward Christian, uh, but that's a slightly different debate. But for many Christian anarchists, and Tolstoy in particular, the re it's the rejection of violence that leads to rejection of the state. Well, that's one of the two, I'd say, main avenues, main lines of argument, according to which Christianity followed consistently would amount to a rejection of the state because the state is violent on a daily basis, or rather because through the state, we are violent against one another on a daily basis, because the state's very existence uh, depends on an allegedly legitimate monopoly over the over the over the use of violence. Uh, allegedly legitimate, because from this perspective, it's not. And yet, of course, that's not what has come down to us through history. And we, you know, even to say that you know a Christian position amounts to anarchism politically jolts people because that's that's not what they understand, right? They they they're they're used to Christian states because they're used to what from a Tolstoyan perspective or Christian anarchist perspective is this Constantinian compromise, betrayal uh, of Jesus' teaching and example uh, you know, in exchange for uh, all sorts of things, comfort, protection, uh, you know, just a different phase, as it were, but, or different relationship. So my impression is, is that it's not just Tolstoy, but Tolstoy, that, that's his main reason for his anarchism anyway. Um, and, and for many Christian anarchists, because of this argument about nonviolence, that many of them end up as, as, as anarchists, if that makes sense. It's, it's interesting to me, and you, I don't know, you probably wouldn't be surprised the amount of pushback we get from your average Christian when they feel like it's necessary to try to work through the state, to change the state, so we can get more Christian ideals out there through the state. And that's just really... Uh, contrary to the teachings of Christ. I mean, there's no, you, you just said it, you know, the state is violence. Jesus is against violence. So why do, there's no, there's no uh, evidence of Jesus using the state to promote his message of peace. It's impossible to do that. But Nicholas, do you have anything you want to add to that? 
Yeah, you know, um, just a, a little bit of background about myself. Um, I come from more of a, a liberal progressive background um, and was in the military for six years, did two tours to Iraq and was wounded in 2011. And uh, I come to anarchism and pacifism through Tolstoy primarily. As you can imagine, coming back from that experience and, and losing uh, several friends to, to suicide who were all involved with me in the military, I came to have a, a lot of issues uh, reconciling the world as I knew it before um, I went on these deployments in, in the military and the world that I knew afterwards. And Tolstoy was uh, the singular figure that kind of reconciled my belief in, in Christianity to the world that I now knew. You know, I, uh, I come to anarchism rather reluctantly. I, you know, was in the military. I'm a, a Southern uh, American. And so, you know, we have history in the South in particular of being quite patriotic and uh, God, family and country, that kind of ideal, uh, even amongst, uh, you know, the progressive liberals of the South. Uh, who may not be quite as progressive and liberal comparatively to the rest of the country. And then I worked for the United States Senate for, for three years after, uh, after I came back. And so uh, I came to anarchism fairly reluctantly, and, and I came through it in the same way that I believe Tolstoy did, as you described in, in your book, um, and that is through pacifism. I came to recognize uh, the state as coercion and as violence. And having already recognized that I was an aspiring pacifist uh, through Tolstoy, I then came to realize that I'm also, whether I liked it or, liked it or not, to, to remain consistent, I, I had to probably be an anarchist as well. And, and, I, and I also identified with, with Tolstoy and his experience of, uh, I believe it was the, the Crimean War that he was a, a veteran of. Um, and so it really did a lot for me personally, but then... It, it seemed to be a, a, a consistent strain of or, or a logical thought that that came from the gospel, you know, because for the longest time, I'd always and, and I think a lot of folks, uh, especially in the United States, we, we have this this cognitive dissonance where we hear these things preached to us day in and, and day out or, or on you know every Sunday morning. Um, these things that, that Christ says that seem, you know, fairly endemic to the entire religion, you know, about peace and, and turning the other cheek and, and, you know, eschewing violence. And, um, and yet it's like we, we go into church and we turn on this one mindset and then we leave church and we think nothing of it for the rest of the week. And, uh, and so it, it, was, it was really the logical consistency that Tolstoy offered that, uh, that really did a, a lot for me. Yes, so Tolstoy uh, uh, fought, of course, in Crimea, so he experienced you know, combat there. He, he also fought the more counterinsurgency type stuff, if you want, in the Caucasus, in kind of modern day Chechnya, if you want, that kind of area, Dagestan, etc., I think, or Chechnya mainly. And it, I think uh, it's interesting what you say, because I can see why Tolstoy speaks in particular to the soldiers and to soldiers and to soldiers who consider themselves Christian. I mean, that, that, that he often addresses Christians who are called to the military. And, he, you know, one of his big things is to advocate conscientious objection to conscription. So I think if I'm fair and a bit more nuanced, when Tolstoy writes the state, the state in Russia at the time is very much violence. It isn't much else. I mean, we may or may not want to go into that, uh, at least in some parts of the world, less so the US maybe than some parts of Europe today, there's other elements to what the state is. But I think what's particularly difficult to do if you want to be consistent in following Jesus, given what he seems to be saying about violence, non-violence, turn the other cheek, is to rely directly or indirectly on violence in order to convey or to do anything. Now, the, not everything that can be done through the state has to rely on violence or have the threat of violence in order to, to, to achieve anything. But a lot of it does, and a lot of laws kind of ultimately rely on the threat of violence. And to that extent, um, yeah, I think it's a fairly sort of systematic, logical proposition that, that, that Tolstoy want to say that a Christian cannot rely on violence and therefore cannot work through the state, at least so long as doing so relies on violence down the line. It's something I've been very 
very strict about in my so I spent a lot of time kind of studying the early church prior to Constantine. You mentioned Constantine earlier. And so when I started to understand, and you know, we have some of the, the, the writings in the Bible, but what was going on after that? You know, so you get into some of these the writings like uh, Tertullian or John Polycarp. Tertullian was probably the most outspoken Christians when it came to the state, when it came to the Roman Empire. And when you start really understanding how they how they viewed the state, they had nothing to do with it. They they did not want anything to do with it. And, and it really solidified for me as a Christian how we're supposed to interact with the state. We know the state exists. We're not, we know it's there, but it's not our thing. You know, it's a, it, we, we are part of a, a kingdom that is not of this world. Jesus talks about that. And so I try not to be hard on other Christians about this. I may come across brash with other Christians with it. I know I do. And I have, I don't have a whole lot of tact and I've had to apologize to some, to some of these folks too, because I do come across very stern with it because I'm a, I'm a black and white type of person. I'm very, it is what it is type person. And if I see how these Christians were behaving early in the first, what, 400 years prior to Constantine, how they were behaving, I mean, why wouldn't we want to kind of follow that example? They were a lot closer to the situation than we are. You know what I mean? Because it seems risky, because it's, 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 uh, it's less comfortable, because uh, it's uncertain, you know, and, and people fear that. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not saying that's that's the right way to do it, right? Um, but I, I can see, I suppose, why people might hesitate. Uh, you, you, you're used to things as they are, and, and, and it's, it's, it's threatening in all sorts of ways uh, to, to you and, and to the status quo. And, and so I suppose I'm not surprised, but I, 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 but I also don't think it's consistent with uh, taking up a cross and following Jesus, which they claim to be doing at least some of the week. I would say also if I'm, if I'm, uh, honest and see i'm i try to be more nuanced but that's the nature of my job rather than sort of black and white i have to otherwise i'm in trouble as academics do um but i i if, if i'm fair i'd acknowledge that um the state as in the word the state i mean it's it's a fairly modern construct a fairly a, a fairly modern term etc and, and it, it's true i think to say uh, and, and maybe i i don't do that much in the book or not enough but well, I think I acknowledge it somewhere, but that um, you know Caesar and and the Roman Empire isn't the same thing as as the state today. But but um, <laughs> you, know, you can trace a direct like, a direct line of continuity, and and a lot of what you know, Jesus says about I suppose the political context of the time uh, seems to apply just as much, if not more, to what we might call the state today. I'm just saying I, I could I acknowledge that the, using the word state is somewhat anachronic or anachronical whatever the word is um as in it's an anachronism it, it, it's, it's using a concept that didn't exist at the time i don't know when i say the state i'm using it as a pejorative these days so I don't, yeah I, i'm using it because i'm using it as, as i'm talking bad about them i'm not using it as, as, as a term of endearment for these folks whatsoever especially as a christian anarchist i just don't see I don't have a whole lot of love for the state. You know, Jesus says, love your enemies. I don't have, <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to go out there and fight them. I'm not going to, you know, more of the, you know, like the pacifist side of it, but I'm not going to sit there and, and agree with it, what they're doing either. Hey folks, Craig here. And I'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog. I don't care if you have any experience or not. Two or three of our contributors had no prior experience writing, and it turns out they have a real knack for it. Our project coordinator helps them put the articles together and she publishes them on our website and Facebook page. And you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in depth about your article. So if you like what we're doing at The Bad Roman and would like to try your hand at writing, then send us an email at thebadromanpodcast at gmail.com. We're having a blast with this project and we would love for you to join us in helping promote it. Now back to the show. So, uh, you know, that, that actually brings up uh, uh, one of the, the points that, that I hope to touch on a bit. You know, there's, uh, there's quite a bit of um, difference in anarchism and how it, uh, Christian anarchism in particular, and how it manifests. Uh, and you make a point of noting in the book that there are some very confrontational strands of, of anarchism, and then there are some that are far more non-confrontational and even believe in strict adherence to 
uh, non-confrontation. Could you could you maybe discuss that a little bit and and maybe talk about uh, where the differences lie and and interpretation and exegesis of that? Yeah, sure. So yeah. <sighs> And some people have not liked that <laughs> in, 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 in the book. Thing is, much of the book isn't really me speaking. It's just me putting together voices that I came across. And it's voices that I came across that were in writing, also in fairness. I didn't really go about interview people who call themselves Christian anarchists. And therefore, there's, there's a bias to some extent because I'm using people who've used the written word. But I did mean to be honest about the tension that there does seem to be in the literature between people like, I suppose, Eamon Hennessy, Kieran O'Reilly, on the one hand, whose activism can be quite confrontational, and people like Werner Deller, who identifies as a Christian anarchist, and yet uh, very much frowns upon such confrontation. And so I guess it partly reflects the spectrum of possibilities between turning the other cheek and overturning the tables, uh, which I think is the spectrum of um, of, of available options um, beyond which you, you spill beyond the, the, the example and the teaching of Jesus. And so it, it also there reflects, I guess, a tension that might be something we feel when we're upset at things between be impatient about others awakening, as in hoping that it will happen, perhaps, etc., versus being upset about the unjust status quo and wanting to do something about it kind of here and now. So I didn't mean to necessarily say that um, that I think that the more confrontational ones are, are, are sort of further away from the message or, or the teaching and example of Jesus, I wanted to point to, 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 to the diversity and the tension. And I don't think that nonviolent civil resistance is necessarily contrary to kind of seeking a nonviolent end, because it's still consistent between its means and its ends. But it's also important to note, I think, that um, Jesus doesn't preach non-resistance, strictly speaking. See, it depends how you interpret the Greek, but it, it, even, even the Greek word and looking at it in its context, it's more about not resisting evil violently, but it's still about resisting evil nonetheless. You can't really claim that Jesus doesn't respond to evil at the very least. There's a reaction that's being called for. Now, the challenge is to work out what that reaction is. Now, Turning the other cheek isn't exactly passive either. It's kind of pointedly suggesting, you know, have another go. Uh, you know, it's it surprises the attacker, or it it hopes to, and and thereby kind of jolt the attacker. And and it's, I think, to, to take it to much less religious context, it's it's why tactics like Gandhi and and and, and others have followed since have at least in some cases worked because they 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 shift the moral high ground you see i think and now i'm talking in in, in language that isn't necessarily christian but it, by responding non-violently and forgivingly uh, but still responding and responding visibly and accepting that violence might be done but against you you take it upon your body you're you're marking a commitment to something you're still noting that there's something that you're not necessarily uh, approving that you're objecting to it but you're also pointedly not reacting violently yourself and that can be surprising for if not the attacker at the very least quite a few of the observers who might therefore think differently about that relationship and for whom the moral high ground shifts because suddenly it's the person who's committing the violence and slapping the cheek again who looks like the the less just one in in that context it, it makes you rethink your assumptions and uh, but either way whether it's a kind of turning of the other cheek or at the, if you want at the more confrontational end overturning the tables there's a reaction uh, it's it's not a passivity right now i'm not and i'm not i'm not here to arbitrate between them and say which one's kind of more christian i think you can make the case that kind of anything along that spectrum is within the realm of what's acceptable, uh, I, I think. Um, I, I suppose I did just want to point out that I don't know if it's a slippery slope. I don't know that it's an, it's necessarily so, but there is the risk that when you, once you become more confrontational, things escalate, you see, and they can easily escalate quite quickly. So I suppose that very least seems to be alert to that and, and, and um, uh, uh, yeah, in order to try and avoid slipping further away, as it were, down that slope. 
while you were talking, I was trying to find it because I was reading this earlier before we got on here out of your book, and you mentioned Gandhi, and we talk about Gandhi some on the show because he wasn't a Christian, but he was he had a he understood the teachings of Christ. And I like what you wrote in this book. This is a, yet according to Andrews, Gandhi suggests that if Christ could only be unchained from the shackles of Christianity, he could become the way not just for Christians but for the whole world. And I think that's important because Christianity is such is such a mess these days. It seems like, and it really takes away from the teachings of Christ. And I think I think Gandhi had it had it right with that. You know, there's people that have some saying some things to say about Gandhi that I'm not. I don't I'm not going to get into. I don't know. I don't know enough about it to speak to it. But if you just speak, to, just talk about the words he's using and what he's saying about Jesus, it makes a lot of sense. And even you mentioned in the book that Martin Luther King mentions Gandhi. Martin Luther King was a devout Christian. He was a pacifist. We talk about it on the show as well that he, the way he went about resisting the state nonviolently, he was adamant about it. We're not going to put hands on them. And these people were getting brutalized out there by the state. That kind of activity, you're going to push the state away a lot quicker that way by being nonviolent because the state only understands violence. So if you're responding with violence, they're going to become more violent. It's also what um, what society will follow after you've done this, you see. So before I say that, um, again, in order to be, I suppose, nuanced, it's it's not that, for example, Gandhi Gandhi's nonviolent, Gandhi's commitment to nonviolence comes only from reading Tolstoy, but he does acknowledge Tolstoy is one of his main influences, and there are others. And 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 Gandhi's not a Christian. I mean, he borrows from uh, from. From Jainism and Hinduism too, but 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 with the method that he adopts and um, and, and or rather the methods, the the, the different tactics, the, the broad strategy that he adopts to sort of campaign for Indian, Indian independence, he does exemplify the kind of politics of resistance, I suppose, that one might legitimately expect from Christians, and and in turn that inspires quite a few others, Martin Luther King, but many others too, and of course. Since then, not that it's only because of Gandhi that all these people have done what they've done, but there have been dozens and dozens of examples of nonviolent campaigns against resistance of all sorts. Not, but not necessarily all Christian. Quite a few Christian too, or with Christian kind of elements and 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 and, and campaigners amongst them, but not only. And uh, this then gets me back to what I was saying before that. that you may or may not know, I have a famous study in 2011, I think, there we go, Why Civil Resistance Works by Erika Chenoweth and Maria Stefan. It's often quoted in various movements these days. What they do is they look at hundreds of campaigns, violent and nonviolent, uh, of resistance against oppression over the last century or so, in order to try and see what's more effective. And it turns out that nonviolent tactics are about twice more effective than violent ones. And even though both fail more often than they succeed, nonviolent ones fail twice less often than violent ones. Okay, and more what they also now they then reflect on why that might be. And one of the things they point out is what I said before, which I think comes from, or you can I suppose deduce or guess from studying Jesus as well, which is that it's this shifting of the moral high ground, right? So reacting violently pulls the pillar of the regime together, reacting non-violently pulls them apart. It means that people close to it might be led to kind of reconsidering what they're doing. And the other thing that they point out in that study is when you look at historically, empirically, what successful violent campaigns have led to, compare them to what successful non-violent campaigns have led to, the latter have been much better at, at leading to stabler societies, more, I suppose, democratic societies or societies that are more respectful of human rights. Whereas you see, violence tends to feed that cycle of violence. And once you get in power violently, typically the regime you'll end up um, maintaining will be one that's, I don't know about just as oppressive as the previous one, but just as happy to be oppressive and violent as the previous one, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know, um, I, I uh, have been doing some work comparing and contrasting uh, Tolstoy and and Dr. King here over the last uh, previous semester. And, uh, you know, I, I found uh, it quite interesting. You know, Dr. King learned much of what he utilized as a Christian means of nonviolent civil resistance from someone who is not, in fact, a Christian. And, uh, and you know, it, it kind of 
kind of circles back around to my my thinking uh, with with folks like C.S. Lewis, who uh, would would argue that you know there's there's truth in many different things, uh, in many different religions, uh, even in atheism, uh, C.S. Lewis would argue, and that all truth points towards God, um, as it were. And so, you know, it's just interesting to make the, the connection that, that, in fact, King learned much of how Christ was and is through someone who was not a professing Christian. Um, and I think it was uh, Gandhi who said, uh, you know, I, I like your Christ. Uh, he is so unlike your Christian. And, uh, you know, that's it's it's really just a, a, a wonderful, succinct way of kind of describing the modern problem. Two things in, in reaction to that. One is um, I'm, a, I'm aware of someone, his name escapes me now, but maybe he doesn't want mentioning anyway, who's currently looking at precisely the connections, to use a loose term, between Martin Luther King and, and, and Tolstoy, because they aren't obvious, uh, except kind of indirectly through Gandhi and, and, and some of the people close to uh, Martin Luther King. You know, I'd be interested in, in, in any studies that try and unpick a bit kind of in more detail what connections there might be and what, what lineage. But, but here, I suppose the other thing I wanted to say is one of the difficulties with all this is how Tolstoy is such an awkward Christian for a lot of people. So even when he does inspire Christians, a lot of these Christians don't necessarily want to openly acknowledge that it's Tolstoy who inspired them because he's awkward. He's awkward because he's vehemently anti-clerical and because he doesn't believe in anything supernatural. For him, it's just the ethics of Jesus he's interested in. He doesn't believe in the resurrection. You know, He doesn't believe in things that for a lot of Christians are essential to being a Christian. I mean, similarly, he's an awkward anarchist because he's kind of religious. He's an awkward... I mean, I, I touch on all that in, in my in the book I eventually did go on to write on Tolstoy's political thought I, way after the PhD. It took me years, but I got there. So I think it, it, Tolstoy is difficult to acknowledge as a source if you're a Christian. And I think that that might have make it harder to trace the way in which he may well have influenced quite a few thinkers and, and Martin Luther King perhaps more so than, than than is obvious from what we know so far. Yeah, I've I've been called an awkward Christian before too. And I don't know if that's the same thing as being called a heretic or not, but I don't agree with everything you said, Tolstoy said, but I'm okay being called awkward. It means I'm probably... Uh, touching on some nerves that people need to hear, but um, I don't remember if it was in your book or if it's something I heard you say in a podcast that I listened to you on when you meant talking about Tolstoy and he seemed to have a problem. I think you just touched on a little bit with the church as an institution. Cause see, this is, this is something I'm struggling with right now as far as with, with my anarchist side of it is, is, is the church side of it because trying to find a church in America that is not embedded with the state is very difficult. I've grown to kind of understand some of the Anabaptist movement. And I think I've heard you talk about the Anabaptist some too. Just, you know, you touched on a little bit. I think it was one of these podcasts and I'm very interested. I've, I've had some Anabaptists on a show and talked to them about it. Now they've got all their, you know, they've got different Anabaptist churches that have their different ways of things. But like the, the original Anabaptist movement to me, from what I can tell was probably one of the, the first anti-state churches past Constantine. Yeah. And, um, so again, what I do in the PhD and therefore the book, like there's a whole chapter, chapter six, I think it is, where I try and look at kind of examples. And, and mainly I list the examples that the sources I have read by then cite. OK, so I'm not, I'm not coming up with them so much as kind of you know, citing those who are cited. And many of the Christian anarchists I read do cite the Anabaptists and, and a few others um, as, 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 as particular examples uh, but in, in, in the sort of post-Constantinian context, in particular, they, they might be the more not notable one. I mean, the Quakers in some way, although not really full anarchists, more kind of pacifists, and even then, not every Quaker church anymore. But in general, I think it's that move back to the source, as in picking up the Bible, reading it, and thinking, well, this is more radical than they tell us every Sunday. Or, you know, it, and it, it, it's something, it, so a lot of Protestant Reformation offshoots, you know, did a move that was similar. Now, it's I, I, one of the things I find fascinating is how hmm, almost every church that kind of shoots off and, you know, comes close to a sort of anarchist position, sooner or later, 
um, gets institutionalized and seems to lose that radicality. And I think that's a, it's a fascinating process that seems to be happening to actually not just religious institutions, but others too. And I kind of I thought a bit about that in in in, in a in an article I've written on on Tolstoy's anti-clericalism. So yes, yeah, sorry, long way of, of of saying and burying in, in in what I'm saying that I agree. The Anabaptists are, are one of the main examples. I mean, the other one, I suppose, but it, it's not a church. That's the other thing is, but the other, the, the particularly vibrant example that people to cite that's kind of contemporary to us is the Catholic worker movement, who aren't all Catholics, as far as I can tell. Um, but but Dorothy Day was she was fa- foundational to it, and and. Um, and a lot of what the Catholic workers do, I suppose, well, as they say, afflicting the comfortable and comforting the afflicted, um, a lot of the work they do, um, you know, is, is pretty close to, to, I suppose, what you'd expect a, a consistent Christian anarchist to do. Hey, folks, Craig here again. As you know, this project is completely self-funded by me, and all profits go straight to charities here in Memphis. If you have a blog, a podcast, or a product that you would like to advertise on the Bad Roman Podcast, the first 15 folks to sign up for four ad spots with us will get a fifth spot for free. Visit thebadroman.com slash ads. I'm so happy how this project has grown and thanks for listening. Now let's get back to the conversation. Well, back to the Anabaptist. One thing that you mentioned, radical. You said the word radical. Okay, so that's, this is what I've tried to do with myself is just get back to Jesus-centric. And I think you mentioned that some in the book and how Tolstoy just kind of, like they don't totally disregard Paul or some of the other, you know, the, the, the other apostles, but they're more interested in what Jesus had to say. And that's really where I'm at with my faith right now is what did Jesus have to say? Not to discount the Bible is not what I'm trying to do because this is where I get called a heretic or this is where I get called a, an awkward Christian, you know, but to simplify it, get back to the teachings of Christ, that's been a whole lot easier for me than to try to explain something Paul said in Romans 13 which I understand what Rome, what he was trying to say in Romans 13. And then I can always also compare it to what Peter was saying in, in Acts 5. So the the two, uh, without getting into that too much, it's very simple for me just to go back to the teachings of Christ and just leave it at that and let everything else kind of fall into place. Yeah, fair enough. Yes. And then, and then um, Tolstoy, uh, among Christian anarchists, is perhaps the, the well, uh, the most kind of, um, determined on this, although the Tolstoyans that follow so people like Eamon Hennessy here are very similar, but yeah, they have very little time for Paul. I mean, I can't remember the, the exact quote, but somewhere it also says something like, you know, if you pay that much attention to Paul, then you should be called a, a, a Paulian or a Paulinian or something, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it's supposed to be Jesus that you follow. And by the way, I suppose if, if Jesus is a, a, a Someone as special as Christians say it is in the eyes of Tolstoy. If 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 it was true, you know that he was the Son of God and that he was resurrected, etc. Then all the more important to actually do what he said, and it's pretty clear what he said without getting too muddled through Paul. And and by the way, on Paul, I think there's a a pretty interesting and it seems to me fairly convincing argument that what he's doing in Romans 13 is is not what we often assume it to be. I mean, I go I go into that in the book and and is actually a, um, an exegesis of sort of uh, of um, of the Sermon on the Mount, but 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 one that we often misread because we often just look at ch- chapter 13 rather than in the context of 12 to 13. He didn't write chapters; they were imposed later. So anyway, that's a different debate. You know, uh, so I, I myself am in, in an Anglican context, which is uh, interesting to say the least, uh, given that it is a tradition that is quite firmly um, established uh, within the state. I mean, the uh, the head of the Anglican Church was King Henry VIII, and so uh, you know, within that state context, it's uh, it's quite quite interesting to to current head is on my banknotes. Sorry, <laughs> indeed, yes. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, and I'm actually uh, next week, Epiphany 4, will be preaching on Romans 13. I don't know that uh, my rector really knows what he's gotten himself into, but uh, he certainly will find out soon. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the, the things uh, I, I did some work with Dr. Amy Laura Hall at, uh, at Duke, and one of the, the connections that I made um, was between uh, Christian anarchism and uh, some of the the more mutualist type uh, groups, uh, primarily within like monastic orders, um, and kind of making some relations uh, between those two, connecting those two. You know, putting aside his fairly controversial uh, social 
commentary. Uh, you know, we have people like Rod Dreher who have offered the Benedict option, which uh, having read through that, I found to be kind of interesting in some of the, the ways that it's proposing to have Christian communities that are kind of set aside, but not outside of the world and essentially trying to achieve independence from the state by essentially ignoring the state. And so that that kind of made some connections with monastic orders and how um, essentially they are mutualist communities uh, that are maybe not overtly attempting to ignore the state, but are certainly trying to be as independent as possible. Um, and I'm and I'm curious, you know, I can't quite remember if you touched on that in the book. Um, but where would you know something like monastic orders uh, and and maybe mutualist communities of of that particular nature? How would that fall uh, within uh, a Christian anarchist kind of um, um, ideal or perception? Tolstoy was aware of them to start with Tolstoy, um, but but was quite adamant that. As he understood it, Jesus's message didn't imply withdrawing from the world, but being in it, being visible in it. Now, okay, maybe being quite different, awkward to use the word we used before, within it, but not withdrawn entirely. Um, and you could say similar things about Dorothy Day and the Catholic workers, you know, who I suppose have, I mean, they have what they call still called houses of hospitality they're often in urban spaces and at least i mean it, that's not as popular i guess or didn't last as long or in uh, agricultural communities i mean the idea was to also have a sort of foot in in i don't know in in the rural life too but but even that's not supposed to be entirely withdrawn from the rest of society so that's how i think a lot of christian anarchists would kind of speak to what you're saying it, it that it's not it's not good enough to withdraw entirely. It might be good in that it might help you, I suppose, try and live more closely to the ideals that you want to live with because you'll you'll be with like-minded people, etc. But you're not having much of an impact in the wider world. Not, I suppose, impact not the right word because you're not supposed to be looking for impact. But you're you're often not visible if you're completely withdrawn. Uh, I mean, one term that anarchists, not necessarily Christian, like is a prefiguration. The idea of showing by your example um, the alternative that you want to see. So that's where a kind of monastic approach has some role to play potentially because in living in community, living by your labor, trying to live by principles of mutual aid, etc., to the extent that it's working, you are, I suppose, prefiguring that kind of society and showing how it can be done. And, you know, few monastic orders are that removed that no one knows about them entirely. You don't just disappear and never, never to be seen again. So that's why I think you can't be too kind of categorical about it. But on the whole, people like all, all, all the way from Tolstoy to Dorothy Day would be keener for an engagement with the wider world rather than a, a too much of a withdrawal. So this this kind of brings me to a related but separate separate issue. Um so this particular, uh, well, the groups that I have frequented, and I believe I can uh, speak for Craig as well, um, the groups that we have frequented and, and come to anarchism through have generally trended towards right anarchism or um, voluntarist and uh, anarcho-capitalist uh, groups. Um, I know that you mentioned that in the book. You know, certainly I don't uh, uh, qualify myself as being uh either of those things anymore, though I certainly still have some tendencies towards, uh, towards both uh, at times, where, you know, Christian anarchism by itself seems to figure very awkwardly into the broader anarchist political perspective. How do all of these, do these groups, are they able to reconcile with one another? Where do they all kind of tend to, to fall together? And, and, you know, can you just speak to kind of the awkwardness of of the various anarchist perspectives and then how Christian anarchism itself seems to kind of, you know, span the whole gamut of, of various perspectives and how that kind of relates. I can try. Uh, it, this is, this is, <laughs> this is controversial, not controversial, but this is a hot potato. People feel passionate about it. I did include uh, 
people who call themselves and who I called in the book Christian anarcho-capitalists because I did come across some of them and some of the stuff they said was therefore written and felt, I don't know, relevant to incorporate it. And, and, and sometimes what they said kind of added to what others said. But I was well aware that this was a controversial move for a lot of anarchists, certainly this side of the pond, as they like to say, there is no such thing as anarcho-capitalism. Now, you, you, can, you can't police words. People can use words that they want. But for many anarchists, anarcho-capitalists are just fundamentalist free marketeers. They're not particularly anarchists. In that, for a lot of anarchists, anarchism isn't just about the freedom to do what you want and to therefore own what you want and do what you want with the, with property. I'll come to that in a minute, I suppose. But it's also about kind of solidarity with the oppressed, about mutual aid, about helping one another. And, and that clashes with what is perhaps a bit too simplistically called capitalism. There's lots of different cap types of capitalism, etc. Now, so the very notion of anarcho-capitalism is something that is, is simply difficult to stomach for many anarchists, certainly this side of the pond. Now, I'm aware that in the States, it's, it's a bit different. And those that have described themselves as anarcho-capitalists have generally come from the American context. So that. Now, I, I do think, I mean, on that one, I... I I tend to sympathize with the anarchist critique of the very possibility of anarcho-capitalism. Anarcho-capitalism, to the extent that it's still going to rely on private property, will find that it needs, at the end of the day, some sort of police force to maintain the property rights upon which capitalism is built. To the extent that essential to capitalism is the right to property, you're going to hit a problem. Now, to be clear, Anarchists don't necessarily have a problem with things like owning the fruits of your labor, as in, you know, you did it with your hands. It's kind of for you to trade it. That's not necessarily the problem. The problem is private property as in land and owning land. And especially when you start uh, with Tolstoy, for example, if you start to sort of accumulate land such that, you know, there's a whole village of people who could very much live by the land, know how to do it, but have no access to it because you own the land and you want it to remain wild so that you can go on a hunt every every month or whatever. That is fundamentally unacceptable for Tolstoy and I suppose unchristian because not caring for the downtrodden and, and, and so on. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm trying to not mix too much the debate about kind of Christian anarchism with respect to anarchism, kind of anarcho-capitalism with respect to anarchism. And, and, and the fact is that, that you then have Christian anarcho-capitalism and Christian anarchism gets complicated. I thought it was an easy question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, Christian anarchists, in my experience, interestingly, perhaps in the Protestant world, usually between tolerated and welcoming the broad anarchist church, if that's the right term, or the broad anarchist community, you know, they certainly are happy to have Christian anarchists alongside them who work as allies. And a lot of Christian anarchists that I've come across in a largely secular context in, in Europe, north, south, east, west, well, east, I don't know as much, but... Uh, you know, are happy for these Christian anarchists to be there as allies. A lot of these Christian anarchists are happy to act as allies alongside anarchists, who, by the way, aren't anarcho-capitalists, but anarchists. As long as the anarchists they work with, these, these Christian anarchists, as long as the anarchists are non-violent. So that would be the red line for a lot of Christian anarchists, as, as much as I can see. Campaign, if necessary, work with anarchists, you know, clearly see sympathies, denounce the state, protest, etc. Uh, but, but, won't cross the sort of line towards what they'll see as violence. It gets tricky when you're talking about violence against property, uh, but, but that's a different debate. Is it violent to smash a window compared to, you know, using a police club against the person who smashed the window, who's committing actual violence? But that, that's a different debate. Now, but it is fair to acknowledge that in some circles, in some anarchist circles, the notion of a religious kind of anarchism is is simply impossible. So in um, in particular, in, in places like France, Spain, Italy, uh, Greece, where anarchism is strongly anti-clerical, and not just anti-clerical, but even anti-religious, then the very possibility of Christian anarchism is, is, is not accepted. Like people think it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a contradiction in terms. How could you? I mean, people who are listening to this might not see that, but uh, behind you, Craig, is a sort of no king but Christ flag. That, that thing is, is, is I think, an, a, a, one good way of capturing kind of 
what Christian anarchism stands for, for a lot of Christian anarchists, but it's precisely problematic for anarchists because, okay, they don't want, they, well, they want no king at all and, and they don't accept Christ as the king. So they'll agree with you on not wanting all the other kings, but they also don't want that one. And, and so there are, you know, it, I wouldn't claim that it's an easy relationship and it does depend who you speak to. I do think, though, that on a lot of, if you want, I don't know about more pragmatic, but a lot of kind of political terrain day in, day out, there are a lot of, yeah, alliances to be made and that are made between kind of Christian anarchists and anarchists. So, yeah, it's a, it's an uneasy relationship sometimes. In, in many places, it, it's a sort of, yeah, why not? And I guess what complicates things further, by the way, is that, you know, uh, at least I can think of a few people who who I think you can legitimately call or call themselves Christian anarchists who are not necessarily anarchists because they are Christians, who don't necessarily come to anarchism through Christianity, but who are kind of both Christians and anarchists. And of course, there are connections, you know, in these things or in, in those people between these things. Um, but the, it's not necessarily that it's the Christianity that leads to the anarchism. And so you have that too, to kind of complicate the picture. But yeah, so I hope that, I don't know if it clarifies things, but at least speaks to your easy question. Well, to the anarcho-capitalist label, when I when I first became an anarchist, you know, and I, and I say this a lot too now, that I'm only an anarchist because I'm a Christian. Now, with the anarcho-capitalist, I was accused of being an ANCAP when I became an anarchist, and I'm like, I don't even know what that means, first of all. Okay, the label was explained to me, and I'm like, whatever. I mean, you can call me whatever you want. I don't. I, I still don't understand it. It doesn't. The, the 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 term doesn't mean anything to me. A lot of, like Nicholas said, a lot of the groups we've been involved with are come from the right. A lot of the folks that work with this project or follow this project come from the right. Now, with the with the the ANCAP side of it, I just, still just don't care. I mean, that, it's just not something that that I worry about too much. You know, it, and if they want to argue about it. That's that's fine. There's I got I think there's bigger fish to fry. And then right now, you know, you just mentioned like the the secular anarchist versus the Christian anarchist. They're gonna have a problem with this, you know, the no king but Christ. Yeah, we run into that a lot with with with, with your secular anarchists. And what I've tried to explain to them over and over, I was like, listen, if you have a problem with me having a king, Christ is my king, then you can keep your anarchy. I don't want nothing to do with your anarchy if that's the way you see it. Now, on 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 the other hand, you need to understand too that you have some allies in Christian anarchists, and we have the same goal as to see the state go away, and we want to live our life peacefully, just like you do. And so, I've I've made some headway with some of these folks trying to explain it to them that way. You know, if they don't want a god, they don't want a king, they don't want Jesus as their king. That's that's between them and. Whoever they, whoever. I mean, I, I, I just don't get into the weeds with them anymore. But that I've run into that quite a bit. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. No, I, I, I recognize that. I mean, the, I think I, I, I've, I've written that somewhere. I don't know if it's in the book or somewhere else. But um, you know, if it is essential uh, in the eyes of anarchists, in order to call you an anarchist, to reject religion, and 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 uh, then Christian anarchists aren't anarchists. But if if what makes an anarchist is a rejection of the state, for example, then Christian anarchists are anarchists. So it kind of it, it depends what you decide to focus on and what's so critical for you. And I think what I, what I then want to add to that is I don't know if it complicates things, but something to bear in mind, I suppose, is is the following. You see, and I'm aware that um, I kind of fell into that trap when I wrote the book as well, to some degree. I think what makes a lot of Christian anarchists anarchists is sort of two main lines of argument. We've talked about one. We might come to another. Uh, one is nonviolence, the nonviolence, the pacifist stuff. The other is idolatry um, and 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 uh, the way in which the state amounts to a form of idolatry so you can go anything from Samuel 1 Samuel 8 uh, to various examples Jesus temptation etc now for a lot of Christian anarchists it's, it's these two things it's, uh, sometimes more one than the other it depends on who you're speaking to that that makes them anarchists now that means that the thing that they reject in the state is the state as violent or the state as idolatry and to that extent, because it's the state that they're rejecting, uh, the label anarchism, I think, is accurate enough. But here's the thing. For a lot of anarchists, not necessarily Christians, if I look at the broader anarchist tradition, 
anarchists don't necessarily reject only the state. And, it, and, it, and it's too simplistic to say that anarchism is just about rejecting the state. So there's all sorts of voices on this discussion these days. And I don't think what I'm saying is necessarily controversial. But so first of all, <laughs> you're going to struggle to get two anarchists to agree on a definition of anarchism. So I'm going to, but I'm going to try. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not going to try, but I'm going to say that I think a lot of anarchists, I think, would agree that ultimately what they oppose is domination or various forms of domination. We can work with that word, for example. Not that it's perfect. There are other words, but non-domination or a critique of domination, hierarchies of domination and oppression, that kind of riff, all right? And if that's what you're worried about, then of course, you're going to be worried about the state to the extent that it's violent and it's an instrument in domination. You're not necessarily worried about idolatry, I suppose, although you can see how domination can, can translate into idolatry in a Christian vocabulary, I suppose. But you're also worried in today's context, well, yes, for example, about sort of capitalism or the current economic system and, and the structures of domination that basically uh, run it um, and maintain it and, and the, the output and kind of some people being dominated by others that, that it kind of give, gives rise to. You, you're going to be worried about other structures of domination, perhaps domination kind of against animals. So quite a few anarchists are kind of keen on kind of veganism, for example, for those reasons. Others see strong solidarity with kind of feminist arguments because of the way, you know, we live in patriarchal societies. And so, and so it can, it can go out in all sorts of directions and, for a lot of anarchists, there's, there's a lot of kind of, yeah, solidarities with various other struggles like that. And, and then this is the point I'm trying to get to. To the extent that Christian anarchists are prioritizing an interpretation of the New Testament, and I'm not saying that's what they all do, but to the extent that a lot of the message is relying ultimately on that, then there isn't a lot that Jesus says that's as explicit about you know all those other struggles as there is about violence and about idolatry the main things that that that, uh, that you can take from i think the gospel as pretty consistent you know repeated throughout and not just the gospel but especially are this kind of rejection of violence as it were to keep it simple and 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 this rejection of idolatry again to keep things simple you don't have that much you know, that like you have more work to do to argue that, you know, caring for the downtrodden has to amount to a rejection of at least some of the forms of capitalism as we know them today, or that it has to extend to kind of solidarity with, I don't know, feminists or whatever. Yet there's more work to be done to make that argument. It's not as obvious as to say, look, turning the other cheek, forgive 77 times. You can, you quote, and it's almost self-evident. It's not as obvious for some of these other things that matter for anarchists and therefore and i'm aware that in the book a lot of the argument that i'm making again quoting those i've written centers on rejecting the state as an instrument of violence and as a form of idolatry but that's not all there is to anarchism and for a lot of anarchists there's a lot more that, that that's significant too about anarchism and, and by the way that also speaks indirectly to the issue of anarcho-capitalism but I'll, I'll leave that kind of implicit in what we've said but th does that make sense Do you see what i'm saying with this yes it, like I said, the the all like Nicholas probably knows more about that than I do. Like I said, when I was when I was called an anarcho capitalist, I didn't like I said I didn't even know what it meant. So it didn't it still doesn't mean anything to me. And 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 I see these I see these people arguing. I see these people, this, these folks that we that we that we are all in kind of the same circles. I see them talking about it all the time. And I'm like, but why are we worried about something like this? Why I don't understand. I don't understand why uh, uh, this topic is, and it, maybe it's just me trying to keep it simple. You know, you, you've heard the you've heard the term "keep it simple, stupid." I say that to myself all the time. <laughs> keep it simple, stupid, and all that other stuff just 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 brings out the weeds. I'm like, well, just just let's get back to what Jesus was saying. Go ahead, Nicholas. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, just to to kind of reiterate the point. You know, I think for for a lot of Americans in particular. Uh, there is an entrance into Christian anarchism either from a a left leaning progressive uh, entrance or a libertarian right leaning entrance, and and that that's all it is. It's an entrance into, um, you know, it, that was that was how I found Christian anarchism, and once I found it and and started studying individuals such as Tolstoy or Elul or or others, you know, I, I find that it depends perhaps on on exactly how I wake up and on which side of the bed that day. But there's a spectrum of things that, you know, I, I find myself kind of sliding on, on a day to day basis. And, and it really, you know, like I said, it, it was an entrance point. It's not where I stayed. And a lot of Christian anarchists who find their way into Christian anarchy 
from the libertarian perspective or the voluntarist perspective, I find that they change over time into something that can't necessarily be identified as libertarian or voluntarist or anarcho-capitalist or you know left-leaning of any type. Like it's something that's an amalgamation of many different things and can't quite be classified other than to say Christian anarchist. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you said this because um, my observation would be similar. It's not, you know, it's not rigorous and scientific and empirical, but at least anecdotal, but with quite a few anecdotes I can think about. I can think of a lot of people who would say something along the lines of what you said, that anarcho-capitalism has been a, a route to, or a trans, you know, a, a position that, that often has <laughs> helped them uh, move from one place to something yeah anarchists might prefer and to and to and to and to a form of christian anarchism that isn't necessarily sort of pro-capitalism it's so i find it that that's one of the reasons i i also find it problematic to immediately scream horror at the notion of anarcho-capitalism the very possibility of it like i can see the point that a lot of anarchists make i don't necessarily disagree fundamentally with their critique of anarcho-capitalism but i think it's important to recognize that it is indeed, at least a transition point for a lot of people. And, and to that extent, if it's an avenue through which people come your way, then don't close it, you know, or don't, or be careful in, in screaming down towards it because um, you, you, you're scaring potential allies, I suppose. But that said, it, yeah, it is a sensitive issue because, as I said, for a lot of anarchists, it's almost more important to be critical of capitalism as we know it today, state-backed, neoliberal capitalism, whatever term you want to use, than it is about the state on its own, because it, 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 the state on its own isn't, isn't the, the only aspect of, if you want, the, the deep injustice out there. Capitalism is critical to it. And, and anarchists are kind of, yeah, for, I suppose, I don't know, forever. They're, they're, but they're, I'm not surprised that they remain particularly critical and vociferous against anything that seems to be pro-capitalism, because it seems to be, you know, a lot of anarcho-capitalists, not necessarily the Christian ones, are basically people who, I suppose, don't want to pay taxes, don't want the state to interfere in any way. It's a, it's an uncomfortable position for a lot of anarchists because even if they might not necessarily like paying taxes, the question is what happens to some vulnerable people if you suddenly withdraw what little support there is for them. I'm, I mean, I'm getting muddled in all sorts of things here, but capitalism is a, is a form of oppression to the extent that at least it, it's kind of unhinged freedom. And let's let's get let's get, let's go this way and try and close it. I think one of the things that makes anarchism as an ideology interesting, secular, uh, I'm speaking not necessarily Christian here, is the way in which it actually tries to keep at the forefront and as equally important, if you want, liberty or freedom and equality. See, we're often told at the very kind of ideologies 101 level that um, communism, socialism are primarily about equality uh, and, and, and freedom often comes after, or, and that's what's led to a number of regimes being quite oppressive, etc. And we're told that at the other end, you know, our liberalism or, and, and, and including therefore capitalism, sort of market liberalism, therefore prioritize freedom uh, over equality, because it, that freedom, especially when it comes to kind of capitalism, is based on an acceptance that there is an economic inequality. Well, f what a lot of anarchists do, um, a lot of secular, if that's the term anarchists do, is they precisely refuse to sacrifice one of these for the other. They maintain equality in the sense of equal treatment, equal dignity for all human beings, you know, uh, treating each other I suppose here you can bring the Christian vocabulary of treating each other with, with love um, and, and caring for one another equally for all human beings. That's where the love of enemies thing comes in, <laughs> uh, challenging though that is, at least as an aspiration. Uh, that is as important as freedom and, and liberty, which, which is important nonetheless. And, and it's because these two are kind of equally important for, for a lot of anarchists that um, well, that's one of the reasons that they're particularly suspicious of anarcho-capitalism. But I went off on one again. Look, to... To, to quote Spider-Man, uh, with great <laughs> power comes great responsibility. And, uh, and, and I've often uh, thought about that in regards to anarchism, especially Christian anarchism. You know, with great freedom, we have uh, a responsibility to use that freedom to help others. And so, like, I, I, I appreciate the idea that you're holding equality and freedom, perhaps, in the same regard, as opposed to, you know, elevating one over the other. Um, and so... Yeah, I like to uh, I like to invoke my uh, childhood adoration of Spider Man in that instance. So. 
I'm afraid he might have plagiarized that. I think others have said it before, but yeah, fine. <laughs> it's sure, point. you know, I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to concede that. <laughs> So I, I was curious, you know, being that I come from a, uh, a rather uh, orthodox tradition uh, in Anglicanism, uh, a liturgical tradition, you know, I was initially rather put off by, by Tolstoy's anti-clericalism. And, you know, and, and it certainly it took me some time to, to warm up to the idea that, you know, certainly the church has plenty of issues uh, that it has brought to the table in kind of muddling the, the message of Christ. I am curious, you know, you make some mention of the Catholic workers movement as being an example of an orthodox uh, tradition, liturgical tradition that that does take on the characteristics of a Christian anarchist ideology. Can you kind of speak to the differences that you've seen in perhaps the more liturgical traditions, such as the Roman Catholic, the Eastern Orthodox and the Anglican or Lutheran uh, traditions, and then the more kind of maybe non-denominational evangelical type Protestant you know, are there differences in their manifestations of Christian anarchism? And uh, could, could you just speak to that, maybe? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, I think I, to the extent that going through the logic of Christian anarchism, right, thinking through what the teaching and example of Jesus would mean and interpreting it as meaning a form of anarchism, to the extent that that basically derives from reading scripture, and that's the case for a lot of them, um, a lot of Christian anarchists, then the, it is kind of fundamentally a kind of Protestant move that's at the core, right? So la scriptura, you kind of ignore the traditional layers of interpretation that have circulated about particular things. You try and look at the original, and maybe then you kind of work back through interpretations and kind of keep the ones that you want. And 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 a lot of Christian anarchists have emerged, it seems to me, in, in broadly Protestant or re- Reformation kind of, contexts okay or in place or either from such churches or in places where i suppose such moves are kind of acceptable tolerated possible now that said you do have examples like for example Tolstoy, who very much does not come from such a context right he comes from the russian orthodox context at least you know historically you have people like dorothy day who was very keen to maintain her catholic practice whilst being politically active as an anarchist as it were so you have examples like these but I, I do think it's it's an interpretation that's more easily maintained, if you want, with a Protestant way of going about, you know, being a Christian, if you see what I'm saying, kind of looking back at the text, interpreting it yourself in the first place, listening to others who've interpreted it themselves, uh, not listening to all the bits in the sermon that tell you how he, Jesus didn't mean what he meant, but actually <laughs> taking it at face value, taking it literally. That's that's often a, a pretty kind of Protestant move, or it's a move that's... that's, that's uh, almost protected in, 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 in the Protestant tradition. The question is then also how much of it, how much anti-clericalism you want to take with it. You see, so without wanting to go too much off on a tangent, Tolstoy is very anti-clerical, but I think some of his anti-clericalism is not necessarily problematic to Christians. Some of it will be. So when it comes to, you know, the resurrection and some of the miracles, I mean, the various dogmas of Christianity, then then his anti-clericalism will be problematic when he questions those kinds of claims. But when he questions uh, the self-importance that the clergy has given to itself, when he questions the, the, the comforts that the churches have have been too happy to to sort of compromise with, then I think a lot of Christians, Protestant Christians in particular, will will sympathize. But yeah, that, that that's more of a tangent. So yeah, I think it's it's probably more of a Protestant move, but not necessarily only so. To give it a short answer, yeah, it, it it's definitely helpful. And you know, I think the the primary things that caused me discomfort were specifically his takes on the resurrection and and you know his his adherence to you know an enlightenment ideal, you know, reason above all things. That was a little bit difficult. I think there's a quote by him, uh, maybe, maybe it's in uh, your your second book, uh, where he says, you know, uh, was Christ resurrected after his, after the crucifixion? Sure, maybe, if so, good for him. You know, like that's, and it was, it was something akin to that. And it was, that, that just, it, it gave me, you know, <laughs> some, some, some chills. <laughs> yeah. No, I can see that. Um, but everything else, you know, his his critique of the church itself, and perhaps its its reliance on focusing on speaking primarily to who Christ was and his description of his divinity, and ensuring that everyone is in line with that. 
they're focused primarily on that as opposed to, hey, this is God incarnate, and God incarnate literally told us how to do day-to-day activities and how we should live one to another. Bringing that up as like, why aren't we more focused on what God incarnate told us to do yeah i mean exactly what well, the move i like I, I, I make that move i think in in that book on also but you know if jesus is the imper- the person that christians insist he is and tolsto doesn't believe in then all the more important to do what he said it seems to me right you know right exactly and you're you you alluded to just a little bit to first thing late earlier and I wanted to know, you, you said something in your book, you, you said the state is a symptom of human imperfection tolerated by God only because he accepts we have rejected him. Were you were you talking about First Samuel 8 when you mentioned that or, was there, or would you like to expand on that just a little bit? I think it, yeah, it's, it's, it's the broad theme of sort of idolatry. So it's one Samuel 8, but it's also the, the third temptation in the desert. It's, it's, it's also to some extent render onto Caesar, maybe bits of Romans 13. You know, 1 Samuel 8, uh, in terms of the chronology, uh, the the Israelites ask for a king to have better military leaders. Samuel consults with God, who replies, they did not reject you, but me. Accept their demand, but warn them of what will happen. Samuel warns them of the abuse of state power that they can look forward to, but they insist, and they choose the state instead of God, because you can't do both, and God concedes that. And what happens with a lot of prophets and kings that follow is kind of, it follows that pattern. So then you get with the expectation of a political messiah, people who again seem to think that, um, or there's an expectation that, that, that I suppose Jesus' politics will be, uh, I guess, what stately or through kind of the political mechanisms we know. And yet that's what he rejects in the third temptation. You know, he associates that with Satan and, and pointedly rejects that and says that, that, that his kingdom is not that kind. Uh, and that's also what he tries to, I guess, clarify and answer some of the questions in his trial, uh, you know, and, 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 and what he exemplifies with a different path with his crucifixion. So it, where it gets tricky is for some Christian anarchists and a, certainly for a lot of non-Christian anarchists or secular anarchists, the idea that the state should be tolerated because God kind of uses it indirectly as something that, that's kind of part of his broader providence, something that he, he he wishes we rejected, but that he still uses nonetheless, despite its evil or what's problematic about it. Um, that That's difficult for you know, non-Christian anarchists to stomach for, I guess, fairly obvious reasons. I think, to say this though, it doesn't mean that you therefore do everything that the state asks of you. And, and where, they're, when the, where the demands are conflicting, then you render unto Caesar what is Caesar, but to God what is God's. So, you know, when the state asks for taxes to the extent that the coinage does belong to the state, it's what it says on it, um, then you render that coin unto Caesar. It, I mean, it's, it's the move, it, it's the interpretation that Christian anarchists make of render unto Caesar. But what belongs to God from a Christian perspective is so much more than kind of coins and statues and public monuments, which is the, about what belongs to Caesar. It's everything else, including life, etc. And so it might be that, um, yeah, the, the, the state is kind of tolerated, that God wants his people to uh, to follow him, as it were, to trust and have faith in him rather than in the state. But once they've not done so, then he will, I suppose, work with us and with our acceptance of the state, work indirectly through it, still call us away from it, but if, if we pay attention anyway. But when the demands are conflicted, then then it's still about kind of following what God wants or what, what the, the message, I suppose, of an example of Jesus as opposed to what the state requires. Does that make sense? Is that yes, sir? Well, the, the reason I ask is because we talk about First Samuel eight quite a bit, and it's interesting to what the list that God goes down in First Samuel eight, saying this is what's going to happen if you demand a king other than me, and we still see it today. It's still happening today, and I don't know if it's getting worse. I think it seems to be getting worse. I don't know, but it's still happening. And we talk about First Samuel 8 quite a bit when we're talking to a Christian still trying, still entangled with the state, and we're trying to get them away from it just to follow Christ and not the state. And when you can lay out First Samuel 8 for them and they kind of see it and then can kind of compare it, let's just use the United States government as an example. I mean, everything that he lists in First Samuel 8, the United States government is doing. Okay. 
So why are you going and putting these people in power when you've already got a king, the best king of all? Yeah, and it, it is, it's the from, from at least the literature that I came across, and it's kind of all the authors I mentioned before, and, and they're the main ones in terms of what's written, uh, and in terms of exegesis that's written that, that, that in, in, in the Christian anarchist sort of camp, if you want. There are other themes, other bits of the Old Testament that they look at, but by and large, First Samuel 8 is the one that's commented on the most, and I think that's because uh, it's then echoed through you know, the third temptation and render unto Caesar and some of the other stuff that comes later in the, in, in the, in the New Testament. Right. All right. One more question. And I, I, I think I know your answer to this because I've heard you talk about it, but I'm going to say my understanding, like I said earlier, my, my reading of the early church was the early church anarchist was Jesus an anarchist. I, I have no doubt in my mind that the answer is yes. Now, do you think there is a case to be made from the book you've written, from the studies you've done, is there a case to be made that the early church were anarchists and that Jesus was an anarchist? Now, they like you said, and I've heard you say this, they weren't running around calling themselves anarchists, <laughs> but just in their everyday activities and the way they responded to the state. So the short answer is yes, uh, predictably. The slightly longer one is, uh, uh, again, to acknowledge some of the nuances and complications. The term anarchism doesn't exist at the time. It's coined in the mid-19th century. It's, it's not a thing. That's one thing. That's one problem, as it were. The state at the time isn't what it is now. But I think I'd point to, I think, a, a very good study. So it's in, uh, in the first volume of Essays in Anarchism and Religion, which I co-edited with a colleague at Loughborough. There's, there's three volumes that have been published there freely accessible online. Um, you, know, you can buy the book if you want. The PDF is, is online. There's a piece in that one from Justin Meggett that's precisely asking that question, you know, can you call Jesus a, an anarchist? And, and he argues that there are a number of recurrent dominant motifs about the figure of Jesus that we can legitimately call anarchists. So things like the notion of the kingdom of God, at least the way it's used, it includes, he says, the active and identification and critique of coercive relations of power. And so that's kind of a form of anarchism. And, and it includes the enactment of a new prefigurative mode of social life, very much an anarchist theme. The way uh, Jesus teaches his message as well, the pedagogy of the historical Jesus, Justin says, is prefigurative and non-coercive, which is, again, very much what anarchists would kind of prioritize too. So even though it is somewhat anachronistic, even though at the time you don't have the state in the way you have it today, I think you can legitimately call Jesus an anarchist and at least some of his early followers, at least as, as people who try to, I guess, take up that <laughs> label, <laughs> that cross, and, and, and follow him. After Constantine, it, it, it gets much more complicated, but you then have a few kind of offshoots here and there. But so yes, the short answer, the longer answer, what I then said. I agree. <laughs> uh, Alex, you got anything you want to plug? Tell us where you can find your book. And what that PDF you just mentioned, uh, mention that again too when you're plugging your book and stuff so people can go look that up. So uh, the, I, I try and maintain, I think it's a Google site, but a list of my publications there. And, and wherever I know it's available online, there's a link to where you can find it for free, right? So a lot of what I've written is available for free. I know, and maybe I shouldn't say this too loud, but I know that the, the Christian Anarchism book is circulating online as a as a PDF, or you there? You know, if you Google it, you can find it for free. I'm not in it for the money, right? I'm not. It's not like I, you know, lots of royalties here. So that's available. Um, the Tolstoy book is more complicated. If people can't access that, get in touch with me. Um, we'll work out something. The essays in anarchism and religion. It's three volumes that are that we precisely got published open access. I mean, the license is one that basically means it's freely available online, although you can buy the book version if you want. We had to kind of crowdfund for it, but it's available. And uh, things like a, a piece I've written on Tolstoy's anti-clericalism also openly available. So some of these are, if you want, scholarly publications. So usually you have to get past the first few hundred words where I kind of set out the originality of what I'm saying in kind of academic language. And then you kind of plunge into into, I guess, the more interesting stuff. So a lot of what I've 
written and where I can, I try and make it available, open access, freely online. So, and usually I list that on, on my website. So I'd say go to that in the first instance. And from there, you can find all the things I've just mentioned. And, and yes, so volume one of that book, uh, that edited book, Essays in Anarchism and Religion, is the one that has that essay, that, um, um, yeah, that chapter by Justin Meggett on Was Jesus an Anarchist? Great. Nicholas, you got anything else? Yeah, I just want to say um, uh, the interesting thing about your uh, the the journals, the essays, um, is that it's it's anarchism and religion in general. Um, so it's it's many different perspectives, which are are really interesting to to make connections and look at. Um, and then um, as far as uh, the the Tolstoy's political thought, uh, Rutledge is very proud of that book uh, on your behalf, um, and I say that because uh, that was that was not a cheap book to purchase uh at all <laughs> but it's very good it's not a question of pride i'm afraid it's way well, it's an academic publisher i you know there are boxes my micromanagers expect me to tick now and then and and unfortunately with books it's publishing with publishers like those and i'm afraid they price at least the hard, the hardback they basically price it for academic libraries university libraries it's completely out of access for, for people and then they did finally they agreed after 18 months to make a, a paperback available but it's, it's still too expensive i would say there's um yep yeah, there's uh, i see you have it there's um there's a short chapter version, if you want, of what the book contains in the third volume of Essays in Anarchism and Religion, where I try and summarize what the book does, although the book does it in much greater depth and with many more Tolstoy quotes. As I said, if that's, you know, if people are priced out of that, then get in touch with me. Um, and if I don't reply, get in touch again. It's my aggressive spam filter. It might have killed your message. Um, but um, <laughs> we'll, we'll work something out. <laughs> But yeah, your uh, your your first book, uh, Christian Anarchism, is great for uh, you know someone who's looking for the basics and and uh, getting a kind of dipping their toes into the the waters and seeing the the varied approaches. And then uh, the Tolstoy's political thought that is a very in depth uh, look at at Tolstoy. I really really enjoyed that. Really did. But it's it's definitely I would recommend starting off with Christian Anarchism, and uh, it, it kind of you know, uh, situates you to the whole terrain. And then uh, Tolstoy's political thought is is great to jump into afterwards. Well, guys, I really appreciate y'all's time. And Alex, I really, really, and I've told you this in, in email, and I appreciate your patience in getting this set up because our time time zone is a lot different. I feel like I got to know you quite quite well through our email and like in your, your daily activities with your children and your family. You know what time is? I know what time you eat dinner now. You know just through our email. And so <laughs> I really appreciate your patience and 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 setting this up. And I, I really appreciate the time coming on. And this was this was a cool conversation. I, I think the the listeners of this show are going to really appreciate this conversation. Well, thanks. It's a pleasure for me, and it was great to get to know you ahead of today as well, and to interact with both of you today. So thank you for having me on, and uh, no, no pleasure. Yes, sir, Nicholas, thank you for uh, taking Abby's spot and. You owe her big. Thank, thank you, Abby. Thank you, Abby. <laughs> there you go. All right, guys, I'm going to let y'all go. Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts to never miss an episode. And while you're at it, if you like what you heard, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, it really helps people find us. 100% of donations are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about The Bad Roman Project and to find show notes, please visit thebadroman.com. <laughs>